Welcome. Uh, for years, I've covered the UN General Assembly high-level meetings and the related events and have tracked how the private sector is engaging um, on that stage and is working with the UN. So I'm excited for this conversation today and to really dive into how the private sector works with UN agencies, how it's engaging on the SDGs and other UN-led initiatives. Joining me for this conversation are Marcos Nato, the Director of the Finance Sector Hub at UNDP, Florian Riza Neri, a Local Network Coordination Specialist for the Connecting Business Initiative, and Lila Karbasi, the Director of Programs at UN Global Compact. Thank you all for joining me. Pleasure. Um, Marcos, I want to start with you today. You, among many other things, oversee UNDP's private sector work. And I was hoping you could give us a bit of an overview on how you've seen that, how you've seen private sector engagement with the UN sort of change over the years and wh where it is today. Thank you, Adva. Um, and it's great to be here with you. Look, I think we, you, you know, you go back and we have Lila here for the creation of the Global Compact more than 20 years ago, if you want, as the formalization of that relationship between the private sector and the UN as a whole. Um, and I think from a conceptual point of view, there is a huge evolution, right? I think we are um, perhaps at the back end or at the end already of the corporate social responsibility way of engaging to one that is much more about core business. So much more about a private sector being an integral partner, right? Um, into the working with the UN, the working in development. And I think the pivotal moment in this transformation is the sustainable development goals and the creation of the SDGs, which is both something that cannot be achieved without business, without the private sector, but also that provides a business opportunity, which was calculated a few years back in about $12 trillion uh, um, for business itself, provided that it puts the SDG as an integral part of its business strategy. And perhaps just to finalize this transition, if you look at the Secretary General, um, our common agenda document, which was published uh, last week, um, it, it explicitly says that the private sector is one of the main actors in the renewed social contract that needs to happen between you know, government, citizens, um, civil society, and business. So I think we are in this phase now of co-creation, in this phase of core business, but there, are, but there are risks associated to it for everybody, and, and we haven't necessarily got to that, uh, to that uh, perfect process as yet, in that sense. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about Global Compact then, because you're a pretty unique organization. You're one of the largest sustainability organizations, but you also have this link to the United Nations. And I know you're not necessarily sort of the gateway to the UN for business, but you really are um, a, a key partner and I think a key entry point for how businesses are looking to engage on the SDGs and some of these issues. And so I was hoping to ask you, you know, how is Global Compact working to engage companies, working to help them sort of navigate how and where to engage with the UN? Um, and so one example, and, and we'll go to Riza in a moment to talk about CBI, but you know, UN Global Compact has these rich local networks in, in many countries. And so are, how are you sort of connecting them into local UN actors? So tell us a little bit about how you're seeing some of that collaboration evolve. Great, thanks Adva and, and great to be here. Um, well, the collaboration has radically evolved over the past couple of years. Um, Global Compact was created 21 years ago um, and uh, today we have more than um, 13,000 companies uh, from multinational companies to smaller companies that engage with the Global Compact. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, almost all parts of the UN today work uh, with the private sector. Um, and uh, although the end goal for the UN and the, the private sector might be distinct, uh, there are lots of uh, common objectives. Um, above all, um, there is the objective to 
uh, build markets uh, for economic growth. And uh, this is something that both uh, the UN and the private sector share as a, as a goal. Uh, but, but also, you know, very concretely uh, in a crisis like the one we're in today uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate change crisis, um, these are really enormous challenges uh, that require everyone uh, to play their part. And in that sense, we can say that uh, the UN needs business and, and business uh, needs the UN. So at the Compact, we work uh, specifically on 10 principles uh, around human rights, labor, the environment and anti-corruption. We have 70 uh, of these local networks that you mentioned around the world. We're, uh, we're also present in other countries where we don't yet have uh, local networks. And, and those local networks are led by businesses um, in, in these 70 countries. Uh, they work with different parts of the UN on you know, very critical issues that have to do, that really go at the core of, uh, of the work of the UN on, on human rights, on peace and security, on humanitarian assistance, um, on, you know, very concretely the types of engagement that we see uh, at the country level with our local networks, with, uh, with the companies that engage with, uh, with the Global Compact or around um, living wage, uh, combating, uh, you know, climate change, uh, the fight against corruption. So lots of issues where um, we need uh, basically that strong collaboration between uh, business and the UN. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna come back to talk about some of those issues in a minute, but I wanna get Rizen to this conversation. And you, and you have a really interesting perspective because you have been a partner outside working with the UN, and now you find yourself at the UN working with private sector partners. And so um, I wanted to sort of get your perspective from that sense of what it was like working with the UN, what some of the potential challenges are, and then how that experience is sort of informing your work today. Sure, and thanks, Adba. You know, I'm from the Philippines, one of the most at-risk countries in the world when it comes to disasters. And I worked for several years with the private sector in disaster management where we collaborated closely with the government and the UN. And my experience is that some issues can only be tackled when we work together. And we've seen this during COVID-19 that there are crises that are too far complex be handled by just one actor alone. So we always go back to the need for a whole of society approach, uh, not just for humanitarian response, but for but with development work in, in general. However, this is always easier said than done. And I clearly remember that when I was still with the private sector, one challenge that we often face uh, is that the private sector and the UN have different work cultures and languages. So we often say the same things, but in a different uh, approach. And uh, that only a UN person can understand the, the whole acronyms that the UN use. The, and this is a constant reminder now that I'm with the UN Connecting Business Initiative that we try as much as we can to facilitate engagements that make sense at the strategic and practical levels to help more businesses before, during, and after disasters. And this is how I think we can improve the engagement between the UN and the private sector and vice versa. Institutional innovation that focuses on fluid collaboration and a common sense of direction to address societal pain points. Thank you. Um, so I think now that we have sort of a foundation led, a foundation laid out of, of you know, what we're sort of seeing and in, in the trends that we've seen change and some of what's um, sort of needed, I want to dive into some of the details. And, and Marcos, UNDP um, has, about to, has about a year to go on its private sector strategy. Um, and so I imagine you're already thinking about the next one. Um, 
And so I wanted to ask you, you know, where do you stand on meeting the targets that you set out in the current strategy? And, and what changes do you think you make in the next version of the strategy? What have you sort of learned through the course of this private sector strategy? And, and what does UNDP need to do differently or, or think differently about, you know, budget differently to, to better engage or to more effectively engage the private sector? Look, um, I think we, we, you know, we've just released um, a new strategic plan that has just been approved by our, by our executive board. So to some degree, the future is in that strategic plan. And in that strategic plan, we actually, you know, uh, the area of finance, partnerships, private sector is an enabler, right, uh, of the strategic plan. And we've got a target to align by, uh, by 2025 to align a trillion dollars of public and private capital, right, to the SDGs. And that is both through actual flows of resources going to SDGs in the Paris Accord, as well as to business business changes, business model changes. The work that we do in CBI, which is a UNDP OCHA, um, UN OCHA initiative with the private sector as well, other works that we have. It. So the future, it, it's, 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 it's kind of laid down in the strategic plan. We just needed to kind of bring it down the next year to the private sector. I think what we've learned already towards that future, if you want, is it's this notion of co-creation and the notion of integrity. I actually think that in this new compact, that societal compact that the Secretary General mentions in our common agenda, um, one of the things that we were fine in the last four years was to look at volume, right? So look at the ESG market has grown and, and is now at $50 trillion. Um, and, you know, business are kind of using the SDGs and putting all of that. But the question is how, how much of the quality, how much of integrity those things have? And I think for us at UNDP, the answer of that question is going to become critical in that sense. You know, have the $50 trillion of ESG really made an impact difference, right? Are the companies that are embedding some of the tools that we are all creating with the greatest intention in the world fundamentally having a different result vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, achieving the SDGs and the Paris Accord? I think that is an important uh, the moment in history, right? And you've seen these uh, questions in that sense. That then brings up to the issue of the role of governments in here and the role of regulation and the role of governments demanding um, coming into this conversation and putting some, some, some issues on the table by which business is going to have to start a report. And I think you've seen this movement um going on with the ifrs uh, uh to create a standard um a sustainability standard board right um maybe the the, the standards on the uh, the task force for climate uh disclosure from companies are going to become mandatory so i think we are in a moment of transition in a moment of a different quality of the relationship in that sense now how we've done in the other partners you know I think we've done it well. We've we've put it in place a few big uh, initiatives and flagships like the SDG Impact, where we created the standards. We actually have got one you now in the last eighteen months about five point five billion dollars of bonds issues according to the standards we put together. First ever SDG bond in the world coming out of Mexico that we work with them, um, and that's all using the market in that sense. You know, we've created platform investment opportunities. Um, so I think we are we've done well in the last four years, but but we're really going to have to work on the quality and the quality of the engagement and the relationship between business and governments. For us, UNDP, this is important because we are not a financial institution, right? So it's about the policy environment, about that relationship, which I think is going to become critical uh, to the integrity of the relationship between business and development in that sense. Hello, I want to turn to you because I know that you at Global Compact spend a lot of time working directly with companies. And so I think it would be useful to get your perspective on, on sort of what you're hearing from them on, on some of those things that Marcus just talked about, the regulation. Um, 
you know, I think there is a big question about the effectiveness of ESG and what those labels mean. And it's a pretty big unanswered question in, in a market that is growing rapidly. Um, and I think how those resources are directed and how much of it is, you know, sort of backed up by, um, you know, analysis to determine the actual impact of those investments or, you know, whether a specific investment goes to a company that is also doing things that are harmful on the on the other hand and sort of how you balance some of these things is is one of the really key questions at this moment so i'm curious how um, you're engaging on some of these questions how you're working with companies what you're hearing um from them on on some of these sort of key issues as, as we move forward yeah, it's a great question, and, and th thanks, Marco, for uh, setting the stage nicely. Um, I think it's a critical question for the sustainability agenda in the next, you know, three to, to five years. We need to get a better understanding of what performance means, what impact means, um, and there is a rise in terms of investments in what is called ESG. Um, there's a mainstreaming of um, ESG practices. There is a, a demand from investors for uh, increased ESG practices from rating agencies um, and 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 generally from you know from from the public. Uh, so the question is, how do we ensure the integrity of the information that is reported? What are the key metrics that we can use and and all of that and. What we see, you know, in, in you know, to your question about, you know, what do you hear um, talking with these thirteen thousand companies um, around the world, is that there is a, a, an increased scrutiny um, in terms of the performance of the company on non-financial uh, data. So the scrutiny on financial data is clear. The reporting on financial performance is is clear from the from the side of business. What is really evolving now is how is a company assessed on its non-financial performance, performance around, for example, you know, tackling uh, climate change, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, dealing with nature, uh, providing living standards, living wage for employees, for the communities around them, respecting diversity, ensuring gender equality. So all of these aspects that are critical uh, for the achievement of the sustainable development goals, how do businesses really perform on those? Um, and, you know, as Marcus was mentioning, uh, there, there is a demand for a more harmonized way of looking at those parameters um, in a way that in compare, you can benchmark, you can, you can, you can really assess the performance. I'm going to give you a very concrete example um, to your earlier question about how do you really work with these companies. We've engaged the CFOs now for over two years um, in a task force. Um, we started with a you know small number of CFOs in 2019. At the end of 2019, now we have 60 um, CFOs, and we've worked with them on very concrete. Uh, metrics that they can disclose in terms of their investments as uh, CFOs. And uh, at this General Assembly, we're announcing that these CFOs are committing to invest 50% of, of um, their portfolio um, into um, sustainable SDG-related uh, practices. And that amounts to $400 billion over the next three years. The, re the question is, okay, how do you know that these investments are actually SDG related? And we've done a lot of work over the past couple of months with the CFOs to look at which metric metrics we're talking about. Uh, how do you avoid, um, you know, offsetting uh, certain parts of your um, of your operations with uh, practices that are not respecting, you know, fundamental rights and uh, that are not advancing possibly the SDGs and, you know, how do you strike the right balance there? And it's, I think it's work in progress for, uh, for everyone working on that topic. And uh, the, the challenge is going to have to be to, to work together uh, as, a, as, a, as a community uh, with the right intention to look at the integrity of uh, what is reported and, and strive for um, the highest level of ambition. 
Riza, I want to turn to you because one of the things that's really interesting about CBI is I think often when we talk about um, engaging the private sector in um, you know this sort of increasingly holistic way, not just looking at them as you know a partner that might write a check. Um, I think that that shift is harder on the humanitarian front, um, or maybe slower. And I think that engagement on humanitarian issues is often still seen as, oh, can cor you know a corporation make a donation? Um, and CBI is really working to engage private sector in a different way. Um, and, and so I wanted to just ask you a, a little bit um, about that and, and tell us a little bit about how CBI is engaging companies differently and you know how they can sort of more effectively work also before disaster um, to, to engage and, and work on these sort of humanitarian and in crisis issues. Thanks, Adva, and, and you're right. And Marcus has already mentioned how there's been a shift already when it comes to how businesses engage from the more CSR perspective to something more operational. And we have seen that the corporate sector has changed in a way that we now see more companies working on humanitarian engagement, not just through philanthropic means, but also using integrative partnerships or when companies themselves make use of their core competencies and technical expertise to provide assistance more effectively. So also companies now see the value of collective private sector action or working through networks such as the CBI member networks and even global compact local networks. And so by being part of a common platform such as these networks, information sharing and coordination of efforts become a lot easier. And we always say that the Connecting Business Initiative's reason for being is really supporting business networks. And um, CBI member networks all around the world represent different structures, approaches, willingness, and uh, capacity when it comes to engagement. And I'll, sh I'll share with you a couple of examples. We have the networks in the Philippines, Madagascar, Mexico, and Haiti working alongside the government and UN humanitarian coordination systems. We have the networks in Fiji and Turkey that are business federations with the reach to thousands of micro, small, medium enterprises. And we have the networks in Sri Lanka and Vanuatu that have strong partnerships with not just individual companies, but also with civil society organizations. So clearly, these networks reflect how the business community now works in a more sustainable and holistic manner as a humanitarian and development partner. Thanks. So now I have a question that I want to pose to all of you, um, which is what, what do you think are some of the biggest failures in private sector UN engagement? Is there a specific instance where you think a program or an effort has just failed? Is there a general sort of issue that seems to get in the way again and again? One of the things I, I can think of is sort of the difference in the pace um, of how often private sector companies in the UN move. So how, how do you sort of get around that and encourage these um, often bureaucratic UN agencies to, to engage in a different way with the private sector? Um, anyone want to jump in first on, on this one? Well, I can, I can say a few things about that. Um, I would say the, the biggest challenge um, maybe it's a it's a permanent failure <laughs> you could call it like that is political acceptance um and uh fundamental trust uh, and this has evolved enormously um uh, in the past couple of years we're we're in a good place now we're in a place where it's accepted for uh un member states governments you know to work with with business but it's not a given and at any time um, it's a it's a risk that needs to be properly um, assessed, managed. Uh, we have to overcome it, um, but it's a constant, you know, um, remind you know. There's a constant reminder that there is a possibility that um, some countries would not accept uh, the you know the simple fact of opening up too much to uh, the influence that. Uh, private actors may have. So it's it's something to to watch because um, 
you need to preserve that space. You need to, um, you know, make sure that this this trust um, is maintained, um, grows. Um, and um, so I would say, you know, from my perspective, that's, that's probably the biggest challenge, not so much a failure, but uh, a constant sort of um, thing to keep in mind. You know, I'm, you've already mentioned one, you know, and, and I think Risa can talk more, is, is the engagement of business in, in the fragile context. It's, it's a challenge. It's a problem, right? And you need that. Because you you know you need to build up in those contexts a domestic uh, you know business in that aspect, and that's a challenge. Um, I perhaps will take the other side of what Leela said, right? Um, I think another challenge is business, you know, wanting to kind of get the UN brand without necessarily you know, having to make, you know, the, the challenge. So when I talk about we are in the moment of co-creation, we now in the moment of, a, you know, where the UN can actually play a role in helping the dialogue between business and governments. Sometimes actually, you know, you got business to say, listen, you know, here's a check. You know, let, let me be your donor, right? Um, and and the, the question is no longer that. The question is, you know, can we actually find a solution together that integrates not your money alone, but your excuse, your expertise, you know? Um, I think, for example, an interesting um, example is the, the the evolution of the relationship we have had it in UNDP, but also with the, the larger UN, with Microsoft, right? Um, which Which is a relationship now that is about what is your vision of the word, and when Microsoft comes back and says, "I want to be a a a net a zero plus carbon company," it doesn't really know how to do that. So then it, it then becomes a conversation with us, you and the P on what do you know that can help me, and what do they know that can help us, and you're actually trying to co-create a, a a solution to this under this level of um, and um, that all happening with this issue that uh, Lila was talking about, right? So um, I think that is where it becomes very complicated. And that also deals with the pace, right? Yeah. They just come and says, you know, oh, I think I have a solution. I said, well, you know, you might have a solution, but that solution doesn't apply in Zambia or in Brazil, whatever. Now our job is to translate what you think is a global solution to the realities in the country level, right? And in that sense, UNDP with 117 offices is, is, is a perfect partner in that aspect. So that, for me, is, is a little bit of the challenges and some of the failures, if you want, um, is the relationships are more complex, they are more honest, or they should be, let's put it that way. Maybe I can also jump in and build on 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 the the challenges. And clearly, for the humanitarian um, environment, the there are several lessons learned. And one of the common concerns we've always seen is always on duplication of efforts. So this relates to um, the pace, the difference when it comes to the pace, and at the same time, the approaches. And the duplication of efforts happen because of lack of awareness and alignment of what the business community has or wants to offer versus what is actually needed by the most affected. And in terms, just to also comment on the difference in terms of pace. And, and when I came into the UN, I always, I, I tell myself that I see the UN system as a slow vessel, but that might not be as, as agile or fast as the private sector. And that was one big adjustment that I had to make, but when it moves, it moves big and in a manner that will impact the lives of many people. So I want to answer this as well in a more optimistic tone that with UNDP strategic plan for 2022-2025, UNDP will focus on anticipatory and preventive measures to address emerging complexity. So I think it's not so much about being fast enough, but more of being able to scan the horizon wide enough and having the foresight to anticipate future scenarios. Great. Well, Riza, thank you very much. We are basically at time, which is a shame because I have many more questions I could 
ask you all and, and would love uh, to talk more about this issue of uh, uh, accountability and integrity and sort of this idea of the UN brand, because I think that's something that UN Global Compact is um, dealing with. And I know you're working on sort of reforming the way the process that companies use to sort of report on their progress um, for Global Compact. Um, but really, I wanted to thank you all uh, for, for joining us and for sharing your insights um, and look forward to hearing from, from you in the future. Thank you. Thank Great. you, Advan. Have a good unga. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.